We're muted. <laughs> How's that? Oh, that's better. Excellent. I was actually literally just saying, can oh, you great. hear me? You should be able to unmute yourselves at your end if you haven't already. Um, oh, there, sure. uh, there, there we go. go. Ah, oh, what a great start. Professional. <laughs> <laughs> well a well-oiled machine. A well-oiled machine, wizardry. yeah. It's because I'm using a slightly different setup today. That is my excuse, and I will stick to that. Um, so <laughs> today we're talking about beasts and monsters. Um, I, we, we, well, when we talked together about what we were going to talk about today, um, this came up because one of the things that we're going to be producing as one of our earlier products is a bestiary. So uh, um, we wanted to talk about beasts and monsters, and we might talk a little bit more about our bestiary later. Um, I did a little bit of um, research um, before we did the stream, just to think about um, medieval bestiaries because they are some of the earliest books um, and some of the earliest things that you find out there. Of course, they were for real life creatures, um, but they often had a theme, like an allegory alongside it. Um, early Christianity used them in the West to talk about um, beasts and how they could, I don't know, display a Christian virtue. And then of course, I've always been fascinated personally with the beasts and the monsters of um, Greek, Roman and other early mythological systems. I see Graham's nodding because I'm sure that many of us who work in the RPG industry um, started out by reading or well in my case I started out by reading my parents books um, about world mythology and that's what really inspired me when I was a kid. So um, if you've got any questions, ideas, thoughts please chuck them in the stream and I will as always bring them up on screen. Today I've got Andy Law, Mark Gibbons, Andy Leask and Graham Davis as you can see and we are now going to get right into beasts and monsters. Um, I am going to start with um, favourite creatures. What do you guys think? Oh, that's always a toughie. I'm going to pass over to Graham. <laughs> oh. Are you? <laughs> if called upon, I would have passed to you. So. Whether he likes it or not. <laughs> it, it really is a tough one. Um, I mean, how can you pick just one? Yeah, can't. Um, but uh, I've recently, or fairly recently, been getting more into into folklore creatures. So the um, the the myriad versions of of the fays uh, I find interesting for their variety, for their uh, their parallels and sort of commentary value on human society, for their different morality. Um, for all, all sorts of reasons. So that would be mine if I had to pick just one. A whole, a whole, you know, uh, oh, just one. Yeah. yeah. Several, one. <laughs> several, <laughs> well, a, several sorry, thousand I'm, in one, you know, that's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you have a particular folklore um, from a particular country that you might sway towards? Um, well, the one I know most about is, um, sort of Celtic, French, Scottish, Irish, mm -hmm. Welsh, Breton. Um, and that's where most of the, uh, the of British and English fairy lore comes from, if you if you follow the threads. Um, yep, that, I've recently, that is a good I've, thing. I've, I've, Yeah, I'm only, uh, in, terms of, in terms of folklore stuff, it's um, uh, stuff that I've encountered in, in the last couple of years. It seems Slavic folklore tends to be the most crazy in terms of really odd, strange, unpleasantness. Oh, it um, does. There's, there's almost nothing. There's almost nothing uh, uh, twee and fey about it. It's all. It's all really, okay. really uh, uh, nasty. Yeah, although I think to a certain extent that's because the orig a lot of the Germanic folklores were watered down for print. So the Brothers Grimm Definitely. and, and yeah. everything, it, it was, you know, even the Norse mythologies and the folklore of the British Isles has been sort of sanitised maybe through the Victorian era, which didn't happen oh, in, absolutely in other was. cultures. Yeah. Um, it, we can come oh, back to yeah. uh, 
to Andy and Andy's favourite creatures later, but I just want to get some of the questions in already. So is there a different be difference between beasts and monsters? I'll I definitely have that. an opinion on this, but Andy Law looks like... I have a very simple speak. opinion on this. When uh, we're building bestries or, as books or products or anything similar, we're constantly looking for categories and um, ways to bundle things together so that they're easily presented. Um, now, depending on the book at hand or the game at hand, depends on how these things may be put together. And typically, there is a very clean difference between beasts and monsters. Beasts are naturally occurring creatures that we all know and love from the real world. Monsters aren't. Monsters are ones that are moving more into the mythical, legendary or something similar. Um, and of course, depending on your game, you'll get a host of other breakdowns um, like cryptids, for example. Something that's one creature melded into another creature or multiple creatures thrown together. Um, but uh, loosely, typically, beasts and monsters are separated with real world creatures, not real world creatures. Um, but... Eldaron76, just an answer to what's your favourite creature, if in doubt, always pick, pick the unicorn, as Scotland did for its national creature. <laughs> the national creature of Scotland, it's real. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I was going to say, for me, the difference between beasts and monsters is also sentient. So for me, beasts would be non-sentient and monsters would be sentient. Um, but then I'm not sure where the cryptid, so like would a griffin, is it sentient? But I would still maybe think that was a monster. What about Andy? What do you think, Andy Lisk? You're a particularly fine wordsmith. No, well, no, I mean, I think Andy's pretty much done it. Like they're, they're more, I, I don't want to bore people too much, but um, it, it, we're falling down Wittgenstein's family resemblances theory of uh, of definitions and categorizations um in that in that they overlap a bit so where you where you decide oh, no. sorry where, where you decide to put the boundary on yeah. well, I mean, he didn't even, he didn't even let him get I'm, warmed up I'm only i'm only trolling him uh, oh. seagoat says river trolls have been my fave since i got my first gw river troll mini i do like a uh, river troll i do have to say thanks to mark for that one um, because he did a pretty good river troll uh, image back in the day, as I recall. Um, oh, uh, and he yeah. also did a really good stone troll one. The stone troll one was a favorite of mine. Um, I know it was I you. Remember. Don't worry if you can't remember. I remember. No, it. I do. Uh, yeah, I was trying to remember. We were having a brief conversation before we came on air about um, uh, I was going through the vault, trying to, in case a question came up, oh, what's the favorite monster? What's your favorite monster? What's the other ones you've worked on and stuff? And, I'm, and I was um, struggling to come up with a, a, a straightforward answer. So I was just leafing through stuff but i never got around to any of the game games workshop stuff because um most the vast majority of stuff i did at workshop the, the the miniatures or at least concepts of the miniatures that existed already so it was just oh can you draw a pretty picture of this uh and there's only studios that i went on to later like 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 blizzard and riot where it's kind of like okay well designers some some creatures come up with stuff that's um uh, interesting and for me it was always I've always I always as much as the big cool monsters are, are, are always a, a bit of a centerpiece I always really enjoy working on um, the more mundane you know trying to put an interesting unusual fantasy spin on a, on a creature that, that we all take for granted you know something that we're all very familiar with um, uh, one springs to mind so I, uh, I when I was at a riot and there was a, 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 a faction within the game called Bilgewater which is a essentially a pirate and they gave it to me because of my natural piratical tendencies um, and, I, and I came up with a creature called the wharf rat which is basically uh, if, a, if a rat uh, and a shark had babies together what would that look like and that became a, 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 a sort of mundane creature but it was there's such sort of pleasure in, in creating something that is, that is every day and yet clearly not. Um, super shiny purple says they reckon monsters are always hostile, but I'd imagine beasts don't need to be. Mm. Yeah, I, I that but, would be my categorization as well. That um, building on what Andy said, yeah, um, natural creatures are beasts, but they're anything that could fall into the category of wildlife. You know, whether they're occurring in our world or not, uh, like the wharf rats of of Mark's creation. But uh, you know, if they're a threat. Then, uh, then they're a monster. Mm. But then, by that uh, margin, in our world, are tigers monsters rather than beasts? Then they are quite threatening. Discuss. <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, "Yes, you yeah. monster." <laughs> I mean, Andy Leesk is certainly a monster. That much is certain. <laughs> 
I mean, how dare he challenge Graham? Oh. <laughs> He's a pillar of the role-playing community. Tiger's, how can Tiger's, do a, that? Tigers are quite charming once you take the trouble to get to know them. <laughs> if you have them to tea, for instance. Exactly. Ah. Oh, 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 oh so is so is monster is is monster a state of being rather than a you know? Can you yeah. transition in and out of monsterhood? I think you could. So if you were a particularly <laughs> urbane minotaur, I've seen it done. Yeah. <laughs> Like, if you were a minotaur who was raised among humans, you know, you had your little waistcoat and, uh, and I don't know, a beer habit, then you ne are not necessarily a monster. This is, not, this is not going in the direction I imagined it would. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now I, I must see a picture of a minotaur in a waistcoat. That's yeah. drinking a beer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's based on one of Andy's character, so you have him to blame for that. Ah, sorry about um, that. I mean, if they can play Blood Bowl, right? Then they can't be <laughs> monstrous all the time. Um, would native within a fantasy world make the same distinction? I think that's um, a very interesting point because often when we're building stuff from our side, um, the categories that we make are not necessarily in-game categories. They're categories designed to be easily used by a player um, or a GM. Uh, but in world, they might have a completely different version. For example, uh, the number of times I've heard people bring up, um, these are chaos monsters in Warhammer. Why? Because they're not in the real world. But in the Warhammer world, a lot of these monsters are just normal. They, they are just the monsters they have. And to say that some are somehow chaos tainted and others aren't is an interesting, perhaps philosophical discussion that needs it to be is. had. And it is. For example, I once had a character who was quite set on the idea of converting the Beastmen to the worship of Tal. She didn't happen to be a Tal worshipper, but she thought it would fit in with their ethos and might, you know, cause them to move away from their somewhat chaotic activities. Because in, in Warhammer work. World, you do missionary work, missionary work, yes. missionary, yes. Work, missionary work yes, amongst man. the beastmen. She was totally up. That's that actually sounds amazing scenario. Actually, it is yeah. an amazing scenario. But sadly, if you go by the books alone, the beastmen are the children of chaos and are thus it's just propaganda. Incapable. It's propaganda. Yeah. There we go. Indeed. Yeah, but um, <laughs> if you go if you go by other books, though, everything is the creation of chaos. Exactly. exactly. It's just the classic othering. The beastmen. Yeah. The beastmen oh, should man. be should be treated with um should with respect kindness their culture. and respect yeah. yeah their culture yeah um anyway that was a little bit of in character insight <laughs> that's not necessarily um a canon view um but Wolf Spain does agree one man's monster is another's friend point of view yeah um, I, I think this is actually that. I think this is actually just in terms of a general discussion perhaps one that we don't want to dive into too deeply here because it could just go on but it is worth mentioning that a great deal of the monsters um, that kick around um, Warhammer World D&D or any of the other role-playing games are there to be killed, and thus they are othered. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but as we've developed as people and looking at um, the source of why these things were othered, um, often we've gone, well, maybe we shouldn't be viewing orcs as tribal, like tribal is bad. Mm. Um, or any of those other words which are culturally different to the culture from which the person who's writing the material comes from. Um, and there is definitely a discussion there, which is perhaps a bit deeper than a discussion on broader bestries. Um, but uh, D&D is, yeah. uh, &D yeah. is currently going through that as a, an issue as they go through various species and go, oh, I mean, this species here is full of stereotypes for certain ethnic backgrounds, and we've turned it into a bad guy and evil. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Can we do that? And the answer yeah. is clearly no. Really, no. That, that it's much deeper than that. Are all beastmen chaos? So, yeah, <clears> it's a really... good question. Although I, I, I was thinking in the run up to our stream that one of the reasons that you need beasts and monsters who are um, who don't necessarily have um, sentience and um, you can't empathize with is because otherwise, if you wanted to use combat constantly in your game then you can't just go around killing people all the time unless you want, like, there's a limited supply of people you can fight with, unless you're playing some kind of, I don't know, constant war game. But otherwise, you kind of need beasts and monsters. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, you're yeah. somewhere between a colonialist or a big game hunter. 
Yeah, I was thinking of the murder hobo groups. Yeah, mm. yeah, there's a few of those out there. Um, and yeah, Siegel is saying early game mysteries were more yeah. or less just a book of things to kill. Yeah, here's it's... a question: um, Is artwork the most important aspect in a bestiary? Well, yes, sure. yes, yes, yes. Next question. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll jump in just to put a contrary view. Yes. Um, um, I'm not just saying yes to, to uh, I think it is one of the most essential parts of it, because particularly when you're mm -hmm. dealing with a gribbly that's not mythologically based, um, understanding what they look like and understanding a little bit of context about where they're from, whether it steals little details around its feet or whatever, makes yeah. an enormous difference when it comes to presenting it to your players as a creature. If I yeah. describe a, a Mick Gribbly, um, and I've got some lovely text describing this Mick Gribbly without a picture, that could look like it's, anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a bunch of stats otherwise. Yeah, yeah, quite. And now there's loads of other things we can discuss, and perhaps we should, regarding the other material that you can put in your bestry, whether it's um, the cultures that these creatures have, if they have such a thing, um, how they gather together in herds, or whether they hunt individually, uh, different ways that you can take them down if you want to go on a monster hunting hunt, um, a la the Witcher, or indeed monster hunter um there's lots of other things that can be included but these just tend to be extra things that are cool and fun but one of i think the core things that you require for any bestery whether it's uh whether it is a, a real world bestery full of myth mm -hmm. mythological creatures or a fantasy one is pictures yeah, yeah. zolchin says it's an important one um it's great to be able to show them to the players but super shiny purple says it depends on how good the writing is <laughs> yeah um, but you know the old <laughs> adage is that a picture paints a thousand words and mm -hmm. it takes far less space on the page than a thousand words does yeah and roderick's got an interesting one if i read a bestiary and saw an amazing pic but a rubbish stat line and write-up i change the stat line and write-up in my game if it's got a great story and rubbish picture i ditch it there you are uh -huh. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just putting well, it all back in the day. I mean, it was, you know, you look at the very, very early uh, RPG books and a lot of the art was, was a, a little bit, I'm sure Special. they won't mind me saying. It was yes. affordable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Affordable. Yeah, good one. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not, I don't know. If I think back about it, did I, as a GM, would, was I putting in monsters who I liked the pictures of regardless of what they did or what their stats were? P probably, knowing me, knowing me, probably. If I saw a cool and, picture, oh, I'm doing that. And if we if we go back to the medieval bestiaries, certainly the pictures in those were a huge part of the appeal, perhaps to the modern day memist, if that's a word, I'm sure it's not. Um, but like pictures of weird cats doing weird things to each other. So they'd clearly <laughs> bestiaries, yes, snails, just random stuff. Yeah. So yeah. hostile that, horticulture. If, Sorry, if I Graham. may interject, is is uh, Art is the reason that you remember the medieval bestiaries, but you don't remember the sources upon which they were based, like Pliny's Natural History, for example. Uh, there's, I've never seen illustrations from that, but a lot of the material did wind up in medieval bestiaries. Um, Flip Top says the old D&D &D Invisible Stalker wasn't even an outline, just an empty box. <laughs> oh, do you, do you remember the miniature that was just a base? <laughs> yeah. Please tell me that's true. It's true. true? I've seen, it was, I used to have one. It was in a blister, just a base, an invisible stalker printed on the card. Oh, that's <laughs> I, I kid you not. What a swizz. <laughs> <laughs> that's the sort of products we want to get into. Oh. <laughs> we, should do a whole, we should do a whole range. We should do a whole army. <laughs> army of the invisible. Yeah. Um, so, hostile horticulture. We've talked about beasts and monsters. Is there a place for hostile horticulture in our beast? Room? Absolutely. I, I, I've, I've drawn a couple, yeah, for um, yeah. Uh, specifically for the best room we're working on because I wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, that sort of breadth of, um, of, of, of uh, challenge and threat and stuff. And usefulness because we talk particularly with plant life, um, you know, if it's once you've, once you've dispatched it, once you've broken the, the, the shears out and, you, you know, you, you've nipped it into pieces, Maybe there's some really useful uh, um, powders and 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 uh, uh, leaves and seeds and stuff that you can uh, uh, turn into potions or uh, harvest for for cash reward. I mean, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I guess the, the very fact that they're sort of connected to the earth as well means that it, I don't know. There's something slightly more visceral when the, the actual landscape is attacking you. It's not just a monster. That you've randomly happened upon. Yeah. The, the, the world itself is out to get you. Um, 
Yeah. That's an interesting thought. Well, you, yeah. just, you just think of Australia because everything will kill you. Isn't there, a, isn't there a tree that if you brush up against it, the pain is so bad it will drive you mad and you will kill yourself? There is. Rather there than is. Cut with the pain of this tree. That's, yep. that, that sounds like a fantasy uh, creation. That doesn't sound like a real thing. Yeah. But of course exactly. it is because it's Australia. Yeah. 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 Now, order than real life. Um, I, I'm a huge uh -huh. fan of these let's say creatures um to, since we're putting in a beastry uh largely because of exactly what andy said um it uh reinforces tone particularly for adventures um mm -hmm. where you can uh add that extra layer of threat plus um they also by their very nature add in different styles of threats for example um uh, funguses bring a whole host of potential unexpected issues like breathing them in. What do the spores do when they're inside you? Do we now need yeah. to deal with diseases and exactly how mm -hmm. those diseases manifest? And whilst creatures can do that as well, particularly if you're looking at things that are parasitical, um, when we're looking at um, our various plant life, um, they've got all manner of horrible enzymes and acids and yuck yeah. that they can do to you. I mean, how many of us weren't to a certain degree uh, obsessed by Venus flytraps when we were a kid? Um, yeah. Just looking at them going, holy crap, that's real. Mm. That's a real thing it's not from venus what the flying <laughs> awesome um yeah. and reproducing those in a variety of different styles has been throughout my career a fun mm. exciting extra um because it just taps into those childhood uh exciting real world into fantasy things for me um, at least so blood blood sedge is that blood sedge or blood, blood sedge. sedge blood sedge uh, um seagulls use that a couple of times in their games and um Flip-top has put a picture of the Invisible Stalker Mini in streams and podcasts, podcasts on our Discord server. Thanks, Flip-top. You're yeah. the best. Um, um, I'm looking forward to that one. Here's an interesting um, one. Matthew Barracliffe wrote a fab little bestiary with no artwork, but it was more like a found journal. Piece of interesting writing for inspiration rather than a game book with actual stats. Perhaps could be enhanced by illustrations, but still a great read. Um, um, I, go, Graham. I've never heard of uh, of such a thing being text only. I've seen a number of art books that have used that conceit, but without art, yeah, I'm not that, sure yeah, how well it would work. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So we were thinking about alternative presentations, and I was thinking about an almanac, for example, which is like a seasonal um handbook that historically was used to tell the tides and the skies etc but now you get them every year and they have like a different theme um you know they'll have recipes they'll have um you know stuff about local flora and fauna and i thought that would make quite an interesting in character almanac um and an alternative presentation to either uh alphabetical bestiary or uh um uh, sort of terrain categorized bestiary, you could have a seasonal bestiary. So the GM could be like, what is it? It's winter, right? This is what I'm likely to find. Um, mm. So a different option for a way of presenting it. And plus almanacs are filled with fun, exciting details that you wouldn't normally get inside uh, discussing whether it's in a real almanac and, um, and discussing recipes from a particular season or particular um, plants you can find during particular seasons, how aggressive they might be as we move into the beastry side during particular yep. seasons, um, when they're flowering and you have to worry about spores and when you have to worry about mm. being attacked by their pollen, which is going to melt your face because I think if anyone should do that, Andy should write that one since he's allergic to almost everything. <laughs> so he should be writing the, um, this particular plant melts your face <laughs> and turns you into a plant zombie. Um, because he looked like a zombie the last time he was here and he met our cat. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, if not necessarily the focus of a product or something similar, certainly makes for a very interesting set of tables or a piece of um, set pieces of information regarding certain creatures that have got seasonal differences. Yeah. And on a base front, bears tend to not be around during winter. And uh, Wolf Spain says a habitat for creatures as an encounter effect is also a great thing to have. So that on yeah. top of some of the other ideas, I also think it makes characters like herbalists um, a bit more interesting because the GM's yeah. got more material to give to them in a different way. Right. I always find when I play a herbalist, I'm like looking for reasons like, is, is there a herb that could help this character rather yeah. than actually <laughs> it being like just woven into the, the background of the scenario. And I think a something like that would be quite helpful. 
Yeah, I think also the effect that um, <clears throat> a creature has on its habitat, the ways they alter their habitat, you know, from tracks to making, you know, where they make their layers and stuff is always a useful thing to have, particularly if you're playing a ranger and uh, you can sort of look or sniff the wind or see a scratch on a tree trunk and say, oh, yeah, that's a bear. We better mm -hmm. watch out for that. Um, Smiling Tom says that's an awesome idea I think about the almanac I remember working on restoring some old farmer al almanac from the 19th century is that and I can totally see how it can give an immersing, immersive setting yeah. yeah I would have it, it's for us because we have a system agnostic setting slightly harder to do an almanac because we don't necessarily have the same days weeks months that because mm -hmm. we're being system agnostic um, but certainly I, I was desperate to do an almanac for warhammer back in the day i thought it would yeah. be amazing i think we could still assume some uh progression of seasons though oh yeah, yeah. yes a seasonal almanac would be um yeah. without going down into the detail of the days weeks months yeah um mm -hmm. vagrant says the old ecology articles in dragon oh, magazine yeah. were real deep dives into creatures as written by a researcher i do oh, yeah, love I a best story written by a researcher <laughs> did yeah, you, Graham? I, I did. I even got yeah. to write one once. I did the one on whites. Nice. Nice. But, uh, yeah, they were they were great, and they they inspired um, part of the approach I took. Uh, well, Keith Baker and I, uh, creative Ebron, uh, we wrote a book for Freeport called Creatures of Freeport, and uh, we were trying to expand out the usual. Um, you know, information that was provided in a bestiary and, and included a lot of the things that we've discussed, like, um, you know, uses of their body parts in alchemy or medicine and uh, common knowledge uh, arranged by uh, difficulty class of the knowledge role, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you, oh, well done. Sorry. You must. <laughs> my cat was attacking me. Um, that was my fault. When I disappeared earlier, I was letting the cat out of this room because he somehow snuck in the little Thanks for that. Um, and I was like, get out, um, which is why I disappeared. So I sent him up to you. Um, <laughs> uh, that's, that's particularly cruel uh, during a live stream where we're talking about beasts to banish the beast <laughs> from the room. Maybe, yeah. maybe he has a valid point he'd like to make. I, yes, maybe he exactly. should be including uh, Shadow in the in the in the discussion that's right yeah um i'll need to get him some treats and bring him on screen he's a particularly fierce siberian cat built for the cold no, so he's not particularly enjoying it right now as mm. we are in seasonably hot weather um so like flip talk go big or go home polar bears tend to be around <laughs> during winter that is a proper monster i think you can't even describe them as beasts they're just too fierce um they tend to wander further south in canada when it's nice and cold for them oh polar so bears they're not monsters they're polar bears <laughs> yeah. how could you <laughs> i mean yeah. polar bears um, i love a polar what bear the, what was the polar bear was it shaco the polar bear in 2000 ad that always ripped people to pieces Oh, he was fairly monstrous. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. And Zoltan's agreeing with in character, like to have a great context description where someone, adventurer, or commoner, savant is telling what he thinks or how he encounters the monster. Mm. Yeah, a good that, bit of flavour is good. I think yeah. flavour text of this ilk is particularly useful um, when it's oh, not yeah. necessarily all true. Um, yes. When uh, mm. you can mix things up for the players as a GM, so you can present the, this is what you've heard about this creature. And to use a single example, so one that we all know, vampires. Um, mm. We all know vampires and we all know ways to kill vampires. And we all know that in many games, many of those ways to kill vampires don't work. Um, because vampires in that particular realm manifest in one particular way. And this is something that we're almost used to when it comes to vampires and broadening that out um, towards other creatures where they've got weaknesses or strengths or particular habitats that they work in. And just people getting stuff wrong is not a bad thing. Um, no. Contextualizing our creatures and making them feel like they're more real and that myths and the legends that build around them is mm. um, always fun. Um, and that's yeah. something, for example, that second edition of Warhammer did pretty well in its best story. 
Mm. And it's something that's really uh, prevalent in the medieval almanacs, uh, where real world creatures are discussed, things like the hoop snake, which would actually take its tail in its uh. mouth and roll along, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, and um, even more recently, the chupacabra, that mystery has been solved. Apparently, they're coyotes with a particular kind of mange, which disfigures them. Huh. And, uh, mm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I saw that Roderick earlier on um, had said that he used to work at the Dundee Science Centre um, and they hosted Natural History Museum Myths and Monsters, rhinos being mm. the origin of unicorns. Now, I had actually heard that narwhals were the origins of unicorns, personally, well, but I guess there might be multiple origin stories. I, I think that narwhal tusks were sold as unicorn horns. <laughs> But I think uh, the I would believe that the the legend of the unicorn itself goes back to Roman and medieval sightings of rhinoceros. I, I, I think I think a unicorn is, is a more plausible creature than a narwhal. You know, just on paper. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's a horse with a big horn. Okay. Yeah. No, it's a big fish with a with a tooth. It's, it's yeah. four foot long. It's that, that, no, surely, surely it's a horse <laughs> yeah. with the horn. Yeah, yeah, you need to take more water with it, yeah. <laughs> it's the national animal of Scotland. It is real. Hmm? It yeah, is. with the haggis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. I quite like this. Um, rhinos are the heavy cavalry of the unicorns. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that, yeah. There's, yeah. A, yeah. there's a good well, army building there. Not my vote, yeah. <laughs> Rhino riders. It's all yep. going a little bit. Black oh, Panther. Mm-hmm. Um, so sorry, I think I've just um, summoned the cat who is here oh. to make an appearance on the stream. Come on, pal. On the, on the best oh. episode. There we oh, go. This is our house beast. <laughs> no, he's a monster. It is. <laughs> I saw what it did to Andy. He's a monster. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> it literally <laughs> creates zombies. Um, I mean, obviously, Andy got better. Um, but <laughs> creates zombies, his eyes bleeding. Yeah. Uh, took about a week, took about a week for my eyes to stop. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, so R Roderick is saying, Is that where the electric zombies discussion came from? <laughs> no, that was from one of my dreams, <clears throat> which is a, a constant source of inspiration around here because Lindsay's dreams are crazy and she remembers them all. Um, in fact, there's a, probably a creature to be built out of some sort of dream weaver that's not the standard there. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. how, <laughs> how many clerkles? That's our standard unit of measurement um, for a general person, um, average person in an RPG, can our moggy defeat? Um, Point one or one leaf? Just one leaf. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and Flip Top thinks yeah. that this house piece needs a lion cut. I knew someone whose uh, who's cat got a lion cut many years ago, a uh, long-haired ginger thing, and it just looked so mortified and wouldn't come out from under the sofa. <laughs> Funny. Um, uh, just as a loose point, on alternative presentations, and we've mm -hmm. discussed in-character almanacs, um, mm -hmm. does anyone else out there, since we've got a few people kicking around, um, have ideas for how they think that alternative presentations could be pitched? Different things that could be done that just aren't done in your standard bestry. We all know that most of them have stats, a picture, um, possibly a bit about habitat, possibly a bit about different versions of them. Um, and then they often go off in a couple of different directions after that if they go any further. Is there anything that you out there would suggest? Um, I think that would be quite an interesting thing for any of you to quickly tap into the comments for us to uh, pick up on, um, mm -hmm. particularly because we're currently, as Lindsay mentioned, building one of our own as well. So it might be a cool Shall idea we... we could use. Yeah. Shall we talk oh, about that on. for a little bit while we wait for comments? The Rookery Bestery, a resource for the Coiled Crown. <laughs> Flip Top's already got one pop-up pictures. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I have actually made a pop-up picture book with Laurie um, for a school project that was about the ghosts of Scotland, and that was quite effective. So watch this space wow. for a pop-up history picture yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I can okay, certainly see some of the characters in yeah in Ship of Fools already. They would they would work fantastically in pop up form. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this that's is just the halflings. <laughs> 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 oh, um, different word of mouth <laughs> descriptions that together are correct but individually misleading. I think I that's a bit like Zoltan. Sort of yeah, yeah, like the the adage of the wise, the blind men and the elephant. Yeah, it's, it's one of my favourite things um, is mm. dropping in rumours and uh, myths that are seeded full of truth. Um, mm. But it's difficult to pick out the bits that definitely are. And further, one thing I particularly like is because we're going system agnostic with our one, just to tie it back into the Coil Crown one, um, they could be true or they might not be true, depending on which choice your GM chooses to go with. And that in and of itself creates a far more interesting and fascinating volume in some respects, because mm. any of those things could be true. You never can be quite certain until you actually encounter it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And it's, yeah. it's one of the things I, I remember, like, particularly when, when we were gaming when I was younger, like, you you you, you really wanted to car like categorize things really, really quickly. So you'd be like, oh, that's just a goblin. That's mm. just a whatever, because you knew what the stats were for the thing. Yeah. And that, that just kills any sense of Absolutely. mystery or immersion or, or curiosity yeah. or excitement or discovery or, or any of that. So anything you can do to keep a little bit of that alive, I think, is, is for the better for, for everyone. Well, even the, the, the classic, the classic Furbolg, which was the regenerating goblin, which got stronger as you hit it. Yeah. Because it was a backwards goblin, yeah. 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 Just, yes. Oh, so the, I, I remember. Nilbog. Yes, that's from an early one. Nilbog, that's it, sorry. Nilbog, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there were several else. like that. There was a, there was a, a mummy variant called the Daddy, that was uh, <laughs> sort of opposite. And, yeah, yeah. Um, a season in the life um, <laughs> monster watch. So this is maybe a particularly UK thing where we have like a TV show called Spring Watch, and I think there's maybe an Autumn Watch one now, but I think it started with Spring Watch. So yeah, oh, um, Badger Watch, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Monster watch. And, we'll need um, a Bill Oddy type. Then we need a Bill yeah. Oddy type to be out there uh, <laughs> supervising the, the wildlife. Scratch and sniff. Oh, I approve. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I, Mike Brunton, when he was working on Realm of Chaos, uh, dearly wanted a scratch and sniff section in there, particularly in the Nurgle section. But, uh, <laughs> oh, couldn't, uh, couldn't, couldn't sell it to mm. management. I wonder um, why. <laughs> here's another one. Um, sample encounters to help people with encounter building. I think that's a good yeah, one because absolutely. you can present something that's a bit different or unusual. I'll, I'll actually yeah. just, I'd, I'd say that in many respects, this is almost, almost required nowadays. Yeah. Um, there is no point in having a big long list of creatures um, that you can just drop in a dungeon if they don't really mean anything. Yeah. Um, it's just a different set of stats. It's just a different miniature. It's just a different appearance of something different has a slightly different power. Where mm -hmm. if you're building building stories, if you're building things that actually engage and make people want to pursue or want to avoid or want to engage with the, whatever the story is at hand, suddenly it contextualizes not just the creature inside the game world, it also yeah. contextualizes your uh, characters with that creature inside the game right. world. Um, and it just makes the whole bestery so much more engaging. Uh, and I, yeah. I think it was 3.5 that first included a tactics section in the monster mm -hmm. descriptions. And uh, oh. ever since then, yeah, that's really become necessary, some kind of encounter guidance. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, does anyone remember the I Spy books? But I, as the note taker of the party, I would quite like a bestiary that was like this, a spotter's handbook. <laughs> <laughs> Where you could have like your own page for notes and you could give one out like to, to each of your players. Mm. I, and they can take notes too. Like, I'm a big what fan of it, people it, taking notes. What, what would be a, if a if a bird watcher is a twitcher? What's a monster spotter or monster watcher? An idiot. A screamer. <laughs> <laughs> a screamer. <laughs> How, um, a runner. <laughs> Oxecutor. Here's a good one. Regarding environments, we usually think of beasts and monsters as rural. This speaks to something we've talked about on previous streams about uh, urban adventures. How about urban creatures, even enormous ones, which affect how a city operates? I think that's a fascinating idea. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I remember discussing ages ago when um, there was a fantasy version of 6mm being created for one of the companies that uh, we were working for. Andy was working for us, this one as well. Um, and that was Target Games. And they were building something that was pretty impressive. But uh, 
one of the reasons it was impressive is because they had proper, enormous stuff that was very much worked into the fabric of the world they were creating. And I remember when Warhammer brought out Warmaster, which was effectively their equivalent of tiny little Warhammer soldiers rather than your standard 28 mil to 32 mil or whatever style soldier. Um, they didn't. They just presented Warhammer armies at that scale. And thus the entire scale become became ineffective while mm. simultaneously having all manner of huge creatures in the warhammer world that changed the world and it would have been interesting to see how it impacted say Warmaster. and then when you move it into a role play game where you tend to move into the far more in-depth version of it um yes big things will be used just take a look at um engineers and what they will with uh their various science skills if you are gigantic monsters out there that could be uh reined in with magic or with science skills people would be using them these mm. things features will be used oh i think we lost andy yeah have we lost Lindsay oh, yeah. as well oh that was crazy that was am i still here you, you just yeah. you just returned both of you looks like so oh, that, that here's a suggestion a for a twitcher, a muncher. As that in, sounds like they eat the monsters. A monster. Oh, a monster, monster. A monster. <laughs> oh very nice. Yeah, nice um, setup. Flip top, <laughs> Mrs. Monster you. Munch. I did have a packet of beef monster munch the other day and it was delicious. Mm. Send us your Pickle address onion. and we'll send Pickle you some. Onion. Yeah, but yeah. they only had single packets of beef monster munch, so that's all I could mm. add to my meal deal. Yeah. Oh, for, no, for, for those not for those not familiar with the brand, it's a it's a, a snack sort of similar to the American Funyuns, but they're all uh, formed in the shape of monster heads, and they come in various flavors. And, oh, and claws, claws, yeah. claws, yeah, and, and claws, much yeah. Better Funyuns, blood. Well, of course, like yeah. Oh, seriously, Funyuns. Mm. Funyuns, Funyuns, for many years was was my 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 uh, un walking back from the pub. Uh, uh, I, I'd buy like a giant uh, uh, American bag of Funyuns and then wake up the next morning just covered in Funyun dust. <laughs> Classy, <laughs> never change, Mark. <laughs> Good times. Good times. <laughs> that was that was your equivalent of the kebab van on the way home, was it? Yes. Well, that and and uh, oh yeah, you get tacos. You get you go to the taco van and you get tacos or burrito and and have a similar experience with that as well. Yeah. Andy Law so, may not remember this, but I'm pretty certain Monster Munch were the first packet of crisps that we shared. Oh, well, isn't that nice and oh. appropriate? Um, yeah, so to finish off on my point <laughs> earlier, um, totally yeah. agree. Big monsters should be woven in as and where mm. it makes sense. And the impact of them should be considered in any world that you create. If you've got yeah. flying creatures and they are being used, walls become so much less um, important for uh defense purposes but arguably more for taxation and similar um as you attempt to control things through another route plus there's going to be people using them to smuggle there's going to be people using them for literally everything yeah. um that you can and every single creature you add to the game you've got to think of the impact that it's going to have whether it is an intelligent mm -hmm. or unintelligent or trainable not trainable or similar and yeah. that's something that could for example be added to a, a sample beastry how this creature Absolutely. changes the world environment around you um yeah. and what you could do with that creature um in a way that you wouldn't necessarily think of uh just by looking at its core stats a absolutely yeah yeah and that that makes them more i mean we've talked earlier in a previous stream about npcs not just standing around with exclamation marks over their heads waiting to hand out quests the same is true of monsters they're not going to just be standing around waiting for someone to hit them with something uh, they're going to be doing something they're going to be used for something and 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 yes, yes, uh, what he said, him. <laughs> I, just want to, I just want to put a pin in something quickly so, so I don't forget it. Just looping back around to the Monster Munch thing. Um, <laughs> in, our world, in our world, in our world, Monster Munch is made from real monsters. No, <laughs> okay. damn straight it is. Just, just want to put that out there for, for later consideration. Yeah. <laughs> so did anyone ever use the sand clam in Warfrit First Edition? Um, and not only did I use it, um, I used it repeatedly, and then I added it into second edition and did a really crappy picture of someone's foot sticking out of the one of them because they were really big. Um, and 
<laughs> it was fun at the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, they were quite fun. You stand on them, you get a foot trapped, and then they get bigger and bigger, and you get eaten like it's a Venus flytrap. Um, it's mm. an equivalent uh, type of yeah. creature. It, it's something you never see in movies these days, but like quicksand, but giant clams used to be everywhere. Every scuba diver would at some point in a, a movie or TV show get their foot trapped in a, a giant clam. And, you know, if Flipper didn't come along and save them, they'd, uh, they'd <laughs> drown their oxygen and run out or the tide had come in or something. <laughs> um here's okay. a here's a suggestion how about an evolutionary diagram of certain monsters i think that's quite a good nice one thing. especially yeah. if you've got um magic magicians or scientists who are speeding up the process of evolution um yes. and and doing kind of um some crazy experiments and you could show how something had gone you know like how they crossed i don't know an orange with a satsuma and got a tanjiro i literally just making that up um but yeah you could show that but in a monster yeah. form yeah well assuming of course, mm -hmm. assuming of course uh, uh, evolution is a is a sort of accepted uh, school of thought yeah. in you know in in any particular given world yeah you know? it does imply a certain well, level of scientific um, development, yeah. doesn't it? But Maybe they're had, breeding, I, breeding rather than evolution as well. Yeah. Two, two points to add yep. to that. Yeah. One, if you're dealing with a fantasy world, you'll often find that they have access to information that normal people don't because they've got gods. And the mm. god can literally say, yeah, evolution's a thing. Done. Mm. Okay, you can get received wisdom in a fashion that you can't get in the real world, which but, means that often fantasy worlds have got access to information that is just unacceptably sci-fi yeah. um, in many yeah. other worlds. Not necessarily something you should do, but it's most certainly something yeah. you can do the, if you want an, to. There's an inverse to that, though, isn't there? In the, if it's in a world in which gods are real, then it also might mean that evolution is less likely to be the case. Um, well, and these creatures think... may have been influenced by the gods directly. So I, I, yeah. I, Unless I, you I, have I, a god of evolution, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I, I, I would I add evolution is, is science, so yeah. it will yeah. always be the case. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be in any way uh, part yeah. of all of the creatures that you have because they yeah. come from different roots. Mm. Yeah. And, and also the evolutionary pressures and processes could very well be impacted by divine activity, mm. you know, without yeah. making either one invalid. Yeah, yeah I was thinking Absolutely. of like Mendel's plant um, diagrams yeah. that he did yeah. when he started reading plants. I guess that was the mid 19th century. Yeah, mm. uh, that's the thing. It, it does. I feel like tonally that that sets quite a a kind of Victorian era. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it, it kind of kind of milieu. But you could absolutely do. I'm thinking more like um, like Da Vinci's uh, uh, Da Vinci Vitruvian Man, like that yeah. that style yeah. of diagram, like something like that. That kind of like an anatomical diagram of dissected creatures. Um, mm -hmm. Weird as it is for the vegetarian of the group to say that, but that might be. A, a, interesting and perhaps a, a yeah. bit more in keeping with a kind of a fantasy aesthetic i, I think yeah. it works very well. xenology yeah. uh, for 40k did that from black library where they took all of the primary species in 40k mm. and they ripped them apart and had a good look inside um and uh that was at that point relatively because they took some different directions for some species that everyone thought well they're just humans aren't they turns out their version of the eldar turned out to be quite different um mm. and th that's that's i think fascinating equally mm. um no no i think i'll leave it off on that one because i'll go yeah, off on a big long so tangent with that one. <laughs> so, um, this uh, is mm. this is a, a set of two comments so an established ecology is relatively settled so but a displaced creature like summoned can cause havoc and which sort of ties into the broader point that in a fantasy realm evolution doesn't have to be the only force of variation and selection no. that's yeah right. that's good no, you, th you think yeah. of the, you think of the grace the grace squirrel wiping out the the red in in uh yeah, uh, in the UK, and I'm reminded of that because I currently have a, a war I'm waging with a squirrel uh, <laughs> outside my house. I think uh, I heard him this morning. And just take a look at <laughs> Australia and the various invasive species that they've got there, and just oh, God, how yeah. much damage um, has been caused, both ecologically mm. um, and in terms of the local species. Um, as one other point on the whole evolutionary front, um, one thing that Avatar the movie did very well. I'm not saying that Avatar the movie did many other things well, but it most certainly did this part well, um, was that they did a consistent set of evolutionary um, steps for all of the creatures yeah. that they had. Um, they hired in people mm. to say, how could we get our six-limbed creatures that do all these things? And then they figured out all the different um, branches mm. of evolution that would eventually 
give you that outcome. So their bestery, for want of a better description, um, their bestery was based on um, evolution in their case, um, mental, mm. um, but well, certainly based on something approximating science, unobtainium. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> not, not to mention the whole... Name. The, the, they the thought about that for minutes, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> The, the creepy, I, I don't want to d d digress too far down kind of <laughs> sh shitting on Avatar, but the fact that they use the same thing for sex that they do for riding their flying horse things, is is that not, not troubling to anyone else? If that's from an evolutionary mm -hmm. perspective, is that not essentially bestiality when they're flying those things then? There is you definitely something that in that. that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> moving I'm on. Enjoy. <laughs> moving on. Monster yeah, thanks, squirrels. Andy. <laughs> So oh, um, yeah. there's a squirrel in Norse mythology. It like runs down from the top of the world mm. tree to the bottom of the world tree, but you don't get many squirrels in other mythologies, I don't think, that no. I've encountered. Maybe oh. I'm just completely ill-informed about other mythology. Well, I've, I've, certain, never seen a squirrel, I've never seen a squirrel beast man either. Sorry. Yeah, you no, don't find there's certain animals that seem to be too cute or too... Mm. Uh, too acceptable to turn into a big monster because the second you turn it into a big monster everyone goes really much like when they did jurassic park and there was the discussion will we add feathers and they couldn't figure out a way to add the feathers without making them look a bit dopey particularly given everyone at the time of the first jurassic park knew that the dinosaurs looked like lizards so to do anything else would have left their creatures looking weird um and similarly when we're making stuff you've got a line that if you cross your stuff just looks daft Mm. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't like dinosaur. I don't like the the current uh, 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 theories about feathered dinosaurs. It's just even if it's even if that is actually w what it looked like, it just they're just giant chickens running around and not as not as scary as big lizards. It's just generally speaking, unless unless it's something like the uh, um, what's the, uh, the, the 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 flightless the two the, the flightless birds the, the prehistoric flightless birds that look really oh, the, frightening. The mower, yeah, mowers. the big giant mowers. Yeah. Yeah, they're yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, they're yeah. yeah but they can't look like that, you know. Yeah. If you stick feathers on a T Rex, it just looks like it's in a costume. It looks <laughs> like it's going to Mardi Gras. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly why Jurassic Park chose the route that it did. Um, and mm. when we're creating bestries, why we have to do a degree curb so for our more fantastical ideas, because the more fantastical you go, the less it becomes a bestry of interesting creatures and their certain circumstances to stuff that only certain people will use. Um, yeah. And you mm. limit you limit the uh, usability mm. of some of the stuff. Now, peppering some of those in there, I think, is well worth doing um, mm. because the world mm. is diverse and it is very interesting. And if we only have skulls on everything, um, I mean, it'll be cool as mints, um, but yeah. we'll also be daft. Yeah, um, if you can, and, yeah, if you can ground uh, it, if you can ground it, even the, the more unusual creatures, if you can ground them in a in a situation or a scenario that, that has weight and, and is somehow convincing, you, you almost create like a little bubble of believability that you can kind yeah. of drop into anywhere as well. That's true. But there is a very fine line to be trod between, um, you know, how fantastic you get. Um, yeah. You know, D&D &D succeeded because it, it used imported a lot of monsters from mythology and a few from horror and what have you. And at the same time, very few people remember Empire of the Petal Throne, which was similar system, completely unique world. Nothing at all was familiar. And I think that's why it didn't catch on. And the, the stuff right. that you present has got to be uh, harking back to our discussion about pictures. It's got to be acceptable. You've got to have something you can grip onto. Mm. Um, yeah. And even the stupid stuff can be acceptable if it is properly latched into the world, even in mm. a perhaps bizarre way, like, say, mimics. Mimics are mm. stupid. Um, I mean, particularly with their initial construction, they're just a bit daft. Look, it's a giant chess creature, um, to use a single example. Uh, but what it's a giant chest. It's a chest. It's a bad guy that I can understand. People hook into that regardless, um, and even though it's really stupid. Um, but in terms of us as creators, I think most of us here, at least, we like to create things that at least feel real. Yeah. Um, they don't feel like something that's just arrived out of nowhere. And if they do, we like to build in a real world example. This creature yeah. exists because of Sorcerer at Y, who did something gribbly back in the past and then it slipped out. And now we yeah. have a whole bunch of crazy creatures mm. sitting out there that look like this. That was a mistake. Um, mm. So making sure that it's properly grounded. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the watchword is the same, only different. Yeah, yeah, and that's what Vagrant's saying just now, bringing real creatures that wouldn't normally be encountered. Deep sea creatures are horrifying, and anglerfish would make an excellent sewer monster. 
and yeah. you don't. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, there, uh, that sort of creature is used in a lot of um, games, whether it's uh, video games or other games, where often, uh, what can I think of one? I think Devil May Cry, I think they had one, which was uh, two women that sat on the end of it, and they used it to entice men in the same way as a siren. Okay, mm -hmm. um, at the end of big, long, um, spiritual, chubby things, you in the dark, the silly man walks in, sees two what looks like naked women, and then suddenly out comes the giant frog hell creature that was using it as um, bait. Um, but yes, it's it's a classic. Um, and using real world creatures and adapting real world stuff is a, it's a good place to begin. Yeah, um, and there's, there's stuff in reality that, you, that no one could ever make up. It's a great yeah. source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Like when we were discussing building locations, it's exactly the same sort of idea. The real world is uh, this great wealth of often ridiculous source material. Um, mm -hmm. And then once you uh, go a little bit, dial it up to 11, it turns mm -hmm. into something often extraordinary. Yeah, well, I mean, that's how uh, aliens, uh, Geiger and so on, they develop from parasitic wasps. And it's horrifying if it happens to people. Mm. Yeah, totally. yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it's another one. Tiny. Yeah, velociraptors are teeny little things, or yeah. were whatever. Um, gribbly, griblies don't have to be big to be scary. Swarms, things that sting, mm. bite, carry disease, etc. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you only need to see how people react when they see swarms of something like, for example, in Australia just now with the swarms of mice. It's um, horrible. It, it's it's literally horrible, and that's yeah. just mice. That's creatures mm. that people are often mm. willing to have running around on their hands. But the second yeah. you turn them into a swarm, it's a completely different kettle of fish. Yeah, well, a swarm kind of becomes a thing on its own. It mm -hmm. becomes a, a living composite entity, and, and we infer will and malice into it mm -hmm. just because it is so big and unpredictable. I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> those evil swarms um they're monsters <laughs> but yeah um swarms they're definitely um a, a gribbly in and of themselves and you'll often find them yeah. categorized as so inside um uh bestries and similar or they'll have a rule for swarming yeah. up um your uh creatures Here's a, another good suggestion. Uh, varieties of most creatures in real life, but bestries yeah. tend to have one. Um, the, I don't uh, know what that... that that's yeah. German. It just means the original. Oh, yeah, and, and I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, the only creature that tends to get a lot of detail added to is dragons et al. Um, yeah. mm. uh, you tend to get all manner of different breeds of dragons, but the second you move over to the next species, it tends to be the example of that species. Right. Um, and in the real world, cats come in a variety of different ways. And unless they're real world equivalents in your best race, where they'll go through them, your lions, your tigers, and all the rest of it, they're all different types of cats. You tend to find <laughs> single examples. I yeah, like this I one. Sorry, Graham. I was just going to say, I think that goes back to the early days of monster books where, you know, lions and tigers would have had identical stats. Mm. And that was it. <laughs> um, Gribblies also don't have to be just something to fight. Never underestimate the chaos caused by <laughs> raccoons stealing That's people's true. stuff at night. This also makes me think of like Scottish and Celtic, like, I don't know, British Isles folklore, like brownies and creatures that have very specific rules for what you do and what they do. So they'll yeah. do things for you. But as soon as you leave a gift, if it was like new shoes, not old shoes, they would completely like then they would curse your house. And there's like a whole range of different um, like right. incredibly complicated rules that. I don't know, are probably being used to tell an allegorical story, but in the fantasy world, they're actually happening to you. But I do, I do like a yeah. raccoon. Probably because yes. I don't have to live with them. <laughs> um, Gribbly's after midnight and getting wet. <laughs> yeah, no. yep. yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that the, the, the blur between um, uh, contemporary real world creatures and then um, uh, supernatural ones and, and, and where you where you sort of set the gauge within your your game world and how, how you know, that balancing act. And um, particularly when, when you're uh, uh, building a, a, a system agnostic hmm. universe, how 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 deep down that that rabbit hole of of myth and fantasy do you really want to go and we said earlier about well you're gonna you mix the stuff up and say well maybe this isn't true maybe this is just folklore maybe this is rumor or maybe this is a real creature or maybe it's based 
on a real creature. And it's down to the players and the GM to sort of investigate that for themselves and find find uh, where they want their world and their experience to be rooted. Mm -hmm. a, a very good way to end the stream, Mark. I oh. to say that was Blimey. a brilliant um, summary uh, yep. um, and happened. round up. <laughs> so um, thank you so much to the other rooks for joining me tonight thanks to everyone who has watched us um and we will speak to you all next week um when we are going to andy law be talking about what oh i i, I just had a slide here i don't have it um pinged up do you want me to pop it up yeah if you could that um, would be great. let me just think... see if i can grab that over here will i uh you talk amongst yourselves while i share this <laughs> over to okay <laughs> we've got one minute why have any real world creatures at all same as humans in a fantasy world yep Mm. Yep, that's a good question. Right. Yeah. And, uh, uh, have I done it? No, you have not. <laughs> well, we I go. remember what we, we're we, talking we, about we next end, week. We, <laughs> um, yeah. and we end the stream as seamlessly as we began it. Yes. We did. Yeah. <laughs> sure. and, excellent. Thank you very much uh, to stream. And oh, as is. I said, we will speak to oh, you all yeah, next sweet. week in which we are discussing um, why does um, producing RPGs take so long? Um, <laughs> see you all next week. Bye. 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 Bye.